Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for staying online. We've got a great session coming up. You uh, listened to uh, uh, the last question in that, uh, in that amazing panel discussion that we had on the role of women uh, in, uh, in job creation in uh, rural areas. Uh, we have uh, 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 Professor A.K. Shukumar, who is, uh, uh, who's, who's spent years researching the subject. Uh, he teaches at Harvard. He teaches at ISB, uh, at uh, YIF. Um, he was on the uh, National Advisory Council. Uh, it's something that uh, is, is, uh, um, is a topic of uh, his, um, his, you know, his deep interest. Um, and uh, uh, he's just joining us in a, at a, in a moment. Um, uh, and I, I'm sure it's going to be a great session. So uh, this, this session is also being telecast live on YouTube um, as well as on uh, Quint's channel. Um, and uh, we would try our best to take questions from YouTube and other streams as well. Um, uh, and we are, of course, uh, following all of your uh, questions here on Zoom. Um, do stay online, uh, ask, um, you know, uh, as many questions as you as you want clearly worded uh, would really help we're just waiting for uh, professor ak shukumar to join I think we're having some technical difficulties. We'll be we'll shortly be on online. Hello. Yes. Hello, Professor. Can you hear us? Professor, can you hear us? Can you hear us? We are not able to hear you. Your audio is uh, seems to be on. Hi. Hi, Professor. Hi. Wait. Hi, I'm on here. But I How are you? See. Wait, 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 one second. I can yeah. see you. Yeah, it's fine. Can you see me now? We can see you, yes. And this I my... think two of your, uh, I think you've opened the same session from two links, maybe. There's a little bit of an echo. Yeah. Let me get it. Is it now okay? Yes, sir, it's Can now okay. Unmute, it's yeah. Okay. 
wonderful you can start great uh, professor thank you so much for joining us for uh, the audience who've joined us uh, so uh, we've got uh, development sector professionals uh, researchers students joining us from across uh, yesterday we had about 10000 of you joining us across uh, wow. from 45 different countries um and this stream is live on zoom it's live on youtube uh, and other streams uh, we are really looking forward to this conversation with professor ak shukmar professor ak shukmar is of course a professor at harvard at isb at yif uh, he is a development economist serves as the director of uh, international center for human development uh, he has contributed regularly to undp's annual human development reports um, and uh, he was also a member on the national advisory council Uh, he is also a board member of the global partnership to end violence against children uh, and co-chair of no in violence in childhood a uh, member of the leadership councils of both international center for research on women and global women's institute at george washington university washington dc uh, professor we were just in the last panel having a conversation on the role of women uh, in mm-hmm. rural jobs and uh, how uh, uh, the the informal nature of their work uh, is being ignored um and how do we formalize that how do we bring uh, bring them uh, you know all the benefits and services uh, um that are available to the larger um, uh, populace and uh, i think it's a, it's a brilliant uh, uh, transition from there of course your topic today will be on the burden of the crisis that we face today on uh, women and children and how do we address those inequalities um i'm really looking forward to the session um i hand it over to you and uh, towards the this session is uh, uh, going to be until 12 15 so we'll reserve the last 10 minutes or so for q and a from the audience uh, if you sure. will in the sure. questions to you thank you sir yeah you. Uh, so thank you very much and good morning to all of you uh, let me begin by thanking you all for joining this uh, session uh, where I shall <clears throat> where i shall present some of my views on the burden of the crisis on women and children i am particularly thankful to the organizers for identifying such a topic uh, because it is so important to focus on people and people's lives rather than getting stuck in sectoral issues as we very often tend to do uh, fixing problems of the different sectors is extremely important uh, so please don't get me wrong uh, but then i find that in the preoccupation with fixing administrative and technical problems we often forget to ask questions about equity and lose sight of the larger goal which is improving the well-being of people and families whose lives the program is meant to change i shall divide my presentation into three parts uh, i just want to begin by talking about inequality which is also a, a theme that is built into this burden of crisis on women and children in the second part i shall focus specifically on how covid has affected the lives of women and children and perhaps widened the inequalities and in the last part i shall talk about what some of the solutions should be so let me begin by discussing inequality uh, we all agree that we live in a very unequal world and most reports at least those discussing income or wealth suggest that inequality is widening this is at times confusing to the average person or common person because when those of us who live in metros and cities look around us we find that even those living in slums now have a much better standard of living they have televisions they have smartphones some of them have motorcycles and they are consuming many of the daily products that you and i or middle class families or the privileged families would do uh, maybe coca cola and and eating chips and so on and so forth uh, young men in the slums wear the same type of t-shirts and blue jeans that children of middle class or rich families wear so much so that if you line up young men in a row it will be difficult to say who is from a rich household and who is from a poor household i often joke that your guess might be wrong because the one wearing the torn jeans might actually be from a rich household similarly a young woman in a slum uses the same shampoo that a film actor advertises uh, because such shampoos are now available in affordable sachets so what the improvements in the standards of living have done is actually to create an illusion of equality and i repeat an illusion of equality 
in the space of commodities. But the reality in the lives of people is very different. While there is convergence in the space of commodities, there is divergence in the space of opportunities. Those living in slums simply do not have access to the same opportunities that children in middle class families have. The opportunity to eat nutritious food, the opportunity to good health care, the opportunity to go to good schools, the opportunity to go on a holiday and so on. In other words, what we should, what the extraordinary improvements in standards of living across the board have pointed out is that we should not be focusing on an expansion of commodities, which is what economic growth is, but on an expansion of opportunities. By the way, we should recognize that the improvements in the standards of living that we observe around us has been possible by the extraordinary growth run that India has enjoyed until very recently. And like I said, economic growth captures an expansion in the production of goods and services. And there is no doubt at all that all sections of society have benefited from it, of course, some more so than others. However, the COVID crisis has exposed all, all of us have been exposed to the COVID crisis pandemic differently, but it has also brought out a harsh reality that economic progress cannot be looked at only in terms of the imp improvements in people's physical standards of living. Many would not have noticed the kinds of precarious lives that people in slums around us lead. Most of the migrants being daily wage earners with no other benefits. Uh, there is nothing called economic security in their lives. So let me conclude this session, this section, by summing up what I'm saying. Traditionally, economists have focused on drawing attention to the persistent and also growing inequalities in the distribution of income and wealth. But COVID shows us that this is not enough. We need to move beyond focusing on in income inequalities and look at inequalities in the economic security of people's lives. And this means that as a society, we need to look at social protection of workers much more seriously than before. I shall come back to this idea at the, ten, at the end when we talk about solutions. Let me move to the second part of the, second part of the presentation and flag some con emerging concerns that affect women and children. And let me start with women. I'm glad that in the previous session, there was also a discussion on the role and contribution of women. And I'm sure a number of the issues must have come up. Uh, but as far as my section is concerned, since we are talking about inequalities, uh, let me flag two very significant facts. First is that the discrimination against girls and women in India is well documented. Much has been written about the son preference of Indian families and notably the daughter aversion and by the way, the sun preference you will find in many societies across the world. But what is striking and particularly uh, sad about Indian society is the daughter aversion uh, that gets manifested in many forms of discrimination against the girl child. Uh, so the anti-female biases are captured, for instance, if you're looking at numbers in the adverse female to male ratio in the country's overall population. And there has also been this disturbing trend of declining female to male ratios among children uh, zero to six years. Uh, I'm, uh, economists are normally supposed to throw a lot of numbers and I've decided today that uh, since I am talking about much more human issues about women and children, I'll resist from uh, doing that. And I'm sure in other sessions, uh, people have talked a lot about of numbers. Uh, the second point to also note is there is not only an anti-female uh, biases and discrimination in Indian society, uh, but women in India enjoy far fewer freedoms than women in other parts of the world. Uh, this might have come up in other sessions also that there are only nine countries in the world that report a lower female labor force participation rate than India's 23%. And by the way, in this 23% is also uh, indicates that there's been a decline in the last 10 or so years in the percentage of women in the labor force. As a consequence, the majority of Indian women work from home. We are all now, men are also beginning to work from home or work at home is I think more importantly uh, because they work very hard at home. 
By the way, I also want to take a pause and say that when it comes to freedoms, uh, there are all kinds of freedoms. And this is just one of the freedoms that women don't have, which is uh, that uh, they're, they're perhaps not in a position to choose. In fact, it starts off when they're very young, not in a position to choose when they will get married, to whom they will get married, and when they will have children, and how many children, etc. Uh, but the, the trajectory of many young women in this country ends with marriage. So, uh, and, and then after marriage is also very difficult because the kinds of restrictions on movements is, is also quite serious. Uh, for instance, the, the Family Health Survey of 2016 says that uh, only about 25% of young women in the age group 15 to 19 years are allowed to even go to healthcare facilities on their own. Uh, so, so that is the kind of restrictions and constraints on freedoms uh, that women and young girls experience. Let's come to the COVID crisis. Now, it is true that COVID seems to be more uh, lenient towards women than men because the mortality rate among men is higher than women across the board. Uh, but if we looked at the gendered impact of the pandemic, women are definitely suffering more than men. And this is in at least three ways. Let me start. The first one is that there is likely to be a substantial increase in the burden on women of household and care work. We are seeing the slowing down of the economy and rising unemployment even before COVID. But with COVID, there are going to be overall job losses and women are everywhere, this is not just about India, but women are generally more vulnerable to being laid off. And this is likely to make the declining female labor force participation rates even lower in the coming year. The economic impacts of COVID are therefore likely to be felt more by women and girls who are, like I said, more likely to lose jobs and are generally earning less saving less and holding insecure jobs and living close to poverty. Now, it is well known that Indian men do not help out at all at home when it comes to cooking, cleaning or doing other household chores as much as men in many other countries. Uh, so uh, even in middle class families where the children are at home because of the lockdown and the husband is at home and other family members are at all at home, uh, you will notice, all of us will notice that the burden on the woman of the household or the wife or the mother increases substantially more than that on men. Uh, in fact, the studies have shown, for example, that the female to male ratio of time devoted to unpaid work. So this is the unpaid work that men and women do at home. The female to male ratio of time devoted to unpaid work is almost 10 in India compared to 1.7 in China and 1.6 in the United States. And so with this unpaid care work, work is, that is usually higher for women, uh, this is likely to increase with, as I said, children out of school staying back at home with heightened need, care needs of older people and increased work in the kitchen. Let me move to the second consequence or impact of uh, COVID on women. And this has to do on, the, on women's sexual and reproductive health. The good news so far on the health front for India has been that more and more women, in fact, over 80% of women are giving births to babies in medical institutions. This has been an extraordinary development and which has ensured the safety of the mother and the safety of the child. When the, when the baby is born in a medical institution. But government data, as some of the government data, as well as reports from the field, talk about a sharp decline in the numbers of institutional births. Uh, this is to be expected uh, given the lockdown. So transport facilities are not available. Uh, many of the private facilities where women were giving birth to babies have shut down because of COVID. And there are also cases where you find that when pregnant women are going for any kind of checkups. Uh, the hospitals are asking you to bring all kinds of reports. They might ask for a blood test and the blood test facility is shut down. So you can't get an ultrasound down because the ultrasound facility is shut down. Or in some cases, they might even ask you to get a COVID free certificate that you're not, uh, don't have the infection, which makes it much more difficult and expensive for poor women to, uh, to get. So on the whole, reaching the health facility and accessing institutional care has become a very, very serious problem. 
And you know, the risks to women's health have therefore gone up substantially, uh, given that, uh, that there could be miscarriage, prematurity, fetal growth restriction, and even maternal deaths. Government figures uh, also reveal that the access to family planning services has dropped sharply. Uh, by the way, one of the, uh, uh, one of the features of women's access to family planning services is that only about 50%, in fact, it's actually 47% of women have use any kind of modern forms of methods of contraception. And the reason they don't do it, it's not because they're not aware of it, uh, but it is simply because women do not have the freedom to choose what method of uh, family planning they would like to use. Uh, just to give you a shocking number, which I think is, is quite uh, 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 revealing about, uh, again, how men take much fewer responsibility for family planning and the burden falls entirely on women is that uh, uh, the, the number of men, the proportion of men using condoms is only about 6% uh, today in India, which would be one of the lowest figures that you will observe in most parts of the developing world. It, so, so what the data also shows that because women have very limited access to temporary methods of family planning, uh, they resort to a lot of sterilization and that has really become uh, the most common form of modern contraception. In fact, 75% of all methods of modern contraception is because of sterilization. Uh, to give you a number, in April 2019, uh, there were close to 200,000 sterilizations conducted. Uh, in April 2019. Uh, we don't have the figures for April 2020, uh, but some of the numbers that were put up, uh, uh, probably they were incomplete, I must admit, because not all states might have reported in April 2020, uh, but show a sharp reduction in this as well. For reasons that we have already explained, that many of the health facilities and resources are being diverted uh, to COVID-related uh, uh, COVID uh, activities. And by the way, the fear of infection is also keeping many women away from going to health facilities and, or even allowing health workers into the homes. And the third concern of, uh, uh, the third concern, area of concern for women has to do with increasing domestic violence. Now data on domestic violence across the world is very difficult to interpret. It is often underreported and that's the general understanding. And so it is in India. Uh, but uh, but in the latest figures we have in India say that 33% of married women have reported some form of spousal violence, it could be physical, emotional or sexual in their married life. Uh, but there are reports of increased intimate partner violence post-COVID from across the world and also from India. Uh, some reports pointed out that the National Commission for Women recorded a more than two-fold surge in complaints of violence against women and girls in the week following uh, the lockdown. Uh, newspaper reports have also covered instances of violence against women, including uh, frontline health workers, a large number of them, including ASHAs, ANMs, Anganwadi workers are women. Uh, by the way, helplines operated by NGOs also report a drop in the number of calls received, uh, and which may indicate the challenges women face in reaching out for support due to confinement and restrictions on mobility. And Childline India, it's a helpline, uh, also reports that they received 30% of the calls received were about requesting protection against abuse and violence against children. Some of this uh, increase in violence after COVID could be attributed to the frustration that men face uh, when they don't have jobs, uh, some people would also argue that because of the shutdown of liquor stores, there was so much more anger and frustration. And this is a manifestation of uh, frustration and uh, the manifestation of this kind of economic stress and frustration is in the form of domestic violence. Uh, but of course, the sad part is there is no reason, uh, no justification why a husband should beat his wife. Uh, but the even more unfortunate part is that only one out of four women have ever sought help or told anybody about the violence they experience. And this is what the National Family Health Survey tells us, that only about 14% have sought help to stop the violence, even when they knew and they reported about it. Uh, let me move to children. Uh, and here, uh, again, there are many, many concerns that have been flagged because of COVID. 
which are likely to widen the inequalities between poor children and privileged children, preventing hunger and starvation and ensuring nutritional well-being is a huge concern. Uh, but I want to flag uh, two uh, other serious developments that are often uh, not picked up. Uh, the first is the mental well-being of children. By the way, mental health has become a major issue and it has remained very much neglected both for adults, adult men, young, uh, young people. In fact, suicide is the biggest cause of death today among youth in India, young men in India. And that is really a startling revelation. Uh, so mental health is something that we need to pay much greater attention, attention to. Experts point out that when children with forced confinement and lockdown, uh, this leads to anxiety and disorders. And in children, it could manifest itself as headaches, muscle pain, body aches, uh, disruption of sleep patterns. Uh, children also tend to exhibit aggressive behavior as a result of the sheer pressure of being confined and restrained with so social interaction. Young adolescents who are also confined, by the way, uh, there's a term called quarantines, uh, when teenagers are quarantined, uh, it also leads to some very kind, serious problems uh, of uh, behavioral problems because of the loss of privacy and social interactions. And by the way, if you are in class 10 or 12 and trying to see uh, what, what your future is in terms of college admissions uh, and so on, that again is a very much, big reason why children uh, are very anxious and uh, disturbed at this point of time. Here again, children live in a very unequal world and how a child in a poor family will cope with boredom and restrictions of movement will be very different from the coping methods that a child can adopt in well-to-do families. Again, talking about the mental health of children, uh, you must also link it to the uh, reported increase in domestic violence. Uh, there is enough evidence to show that when children grow up in a, in a home where they observe domestic violence, where the father is beating the wife, it really adver it adversely affects the behavior of both boys and girls. Uh, boys grow up to becoming uh, much more, they begin to, in, uh, to exhibit similar behaviors of aggression and bullying. And as far as girls are concerned, they grow up accepting such wife beating as normal. And so both of these, uh, both of these have to be really addressed quite seriously. The second issue uh, when it comes to children is, has to do with schooling. And I talk about schooling uh, because it is an, it's a very, very big gap in our own, uh, in our own uh, uh, development, uh, how the neglect of schooling is something that, again, I'll pick up at the end of my presentation. Uh, of course, with the lockdown, children have not been allowed to go to school. And for a child, uh, schooling, a school is much more than just attending classes. Uh, children miss out on the joy of play and interactions, sports, and just being out of the house and chatting with friends. And now if you're forced to sit, if you're an urban a kid in a privileged house and you're forced to sit for six to eight hours in front of a computer screen, uh, this can have terrible consequences. Uh, apart from all the body ache and neck ache, uh, which many of us also suffer from because we're sitting in front of computers most of the day, uh, there is also an implication of childhood obesity uh, when it comes to urban children. And my, mind you, while we are talking of undernutrition and stunting on one hand, which is a serious problem, uh, there is also the concern with uh, child obesity in affluent families in cities in particular. Imagine how you would uh, deal with the boredom of a child who's nagging you all day uh, perhaps uh, uh, concede to giving him or her a packet of chips and a glass of Coke or something like that. Uh, so for children in rural areas, the disruption is even more serious. Uh, when ICDS centers and schools are shut, uh, children are denied access to midday meals and supplementary foods. And for many poor families, this perhaps is the most nutritious meal that the child gets during the day. Uh, the second problem is even more uh, so when, when you're talking about learning from home. Um, uh, uh, learning from home that if you don't have decent access to internet connectivity and computers at home, there can be a serious disruption or a setback. Uh, and this will again widen the gaps between the educational attainments of poor children and the uh, privileged children that we observe. And it's a form of educational injustice uh, that will be perpetuated uh, by this online teaching and learning. Don't forget that when you're saying learn from home, uh, uh, 
privileged children have the advantage of parents and elders helping them from home. Uh, whereas if you are a first generation learner and do have a smartphone at home and can do some lessons on home, don't forget that you have no support at home of whatsoever. So, so this is going to create a lot of inequalities. Uh, finally, I want to say that flag that when girls uh, drop out at this at uh, senior school or secondary school in villages because of these problems of shutdown, they also face the risk of getting pulled into child labor uh, or even getting forced into early marriages. So, so, so COVID has actually uh, flagged or uh, or magnified or amplified many of the injustices and inequalities we see in the lives of women and children. Let me move to the last part of my presentation. Um, uh, what should India do? Uh, what should India do? Uh, it's, it is too soon to comment on the economic packages and stimulus packages announced by the governments. Uh, three questions, however, remain to be answered, and this can be done only over a period of time. Why were these announcements made so late? Second, will the food and cash benefits announced for migrant workers and others be sufficient to restore livelihoods and economic security. Third, given the uncertainty in the spread of the virus, is there a contingency plan to step up such investments in ensuring the security of people's lives? Uh, so, so these questions will always remain because as we know, the COVID uh, pandemic has not played out fully or even partially uh, in India, and there's much uncertainty in the years to come, in the months to come. So uh, what has this COVID virus pointed out? Uh, that there is an emergency response and everybody is focused on that. Uh, but in the post-COVID era, era, whenever that comes, or even now actually not to wait for the post-COVID, uh, there are three or four areas where urgent investment and attention is needed. The first has, of course, to do with health. And in health, well, we must recognize that the successful efforts by the state governments and central government so far to contain the spread of the of the virus uh, has brought out the critical importance of the public sector in health. Credit for containing the spread of the virus goes to India's frontline medical and health workers in government, and I underscore government, uh, in government who have led the charge, putting aside threats to personal safety, stigma, and family interests. Uh, where has the private sector been? In some places, in small pockets, yes, but by and large, the private sector, which now accounts for a significant amount of hospitals, 80% of hospitals, 80%, 60, 70%, over 70% of hospital beds, etc., has not been able to rise to the challenge and play a meaningful role in this, uh, in this national crisis. So it really points out, and by the way, any country that has achieved anything like universal health coverage has done it through a strong public sector or a government health sector. And the reality is that India spends only about 1.2% of GDP on health, which is one of the lowest and it has been remaining stagnant for over 10, 12 years. So the real urgent need is uh, we have to step up investments across the state governments, states and by the center in ensuring a very strong primary healthcare uh, service delivery system in India. Second, I think the food and cash benefits, I think uh, there have been some announcements yesterday which are in the right direction, uh, but the reforming the food-based safety nets is essential, especially to ensure at this stage inclusion of non-card holders, universalization of ration cards. I think this uh, portability of ration cards is again a step in the right direction, but also add diversification of food baskets and so on to really make this very, very important. Similarly, when it comes to direct cash transfers, it has benefited women and farmers, and I'm not going into the difficulties of the whether 500 rupees is enough or it should be 2,000 rupees, but this is an opportunity to revisit the implementation of such schemes and, and address the issues of delayed, rejected, blocked, or diverted payments related to a number of direct benefit cash, uh, transfer schemes that we read off so often. Third is schooling. Uh, again, I've already talked a little bit about it, but the future of India cannot be built on such a frail and weak schooling system. And no country in the world will you find that the government school sector is so weak. In fact, in most uh, countries of Europe and America, you will find that a vast majority of children go to government schools. So if you really want to assure quality schooling to all children, 
as is assured in the constitution, it has to be led by a very strong school, government school system. And so we have to rethink, we have to rethink the entire uh, vision that we have of the future of schooling in India. The last point, and I think uh, we should not, uh, uh, yeah, I'll just, yeah, uh, that, that there has been a positive fallout of the COVID, which has very important significance for children and adults too. And this has to do with the clean air uh, that we breathe today. It's a, it's a remarkable, for those of us who live in New Delhi, we know what this means. We have never seen uh, the air so clean, the sky so clean, the birds chirping. Uh, there is such a, such a, you know, it almost looks like nature is celebrating, the trees and birds are celebrating uh, the freedoms that they have uh, got. Uh, the demand for oil and gas has fallen. Uh, emissions of carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide have been greatly reduced and so has air pollution. I th and I think what this new force of doing conferences, etc., also tells us that as we go ahead, we must think of more innovative ways by which we cut down energy consumption, cut down unnecessary travel and transportation, and really uh, reboot a city like New Delhi with a fantastic plan to maintain the quality of environment. Because one of the biggest threats that, India, uh, that Delhi's children or any, uh, any child in a polluted environment faces is respiratory diseases which have a long-lasting lifelong impact on the future of the children. So let me end by saying that as adults we have a responsibility to build a better world for children, certainly a more equal world, uh, but for me that equality lies in ensuring equality of human security, which means equality of economic security, equality of food security, equality of educational security and so forth so on so in other words we need a more equal and a more secure society thank you and i'll stop here thank you professor that was a great session uh, i think uh, we touched on a lot of topics there are some uh, questions we have six minutes i'll take uh, one question from Ms. priya shankar uh, she wants you to talk about the intersectionality of caste and religion in inequalities uh, women and children uh, especially in these times of crisis. Yeah, I think I think it's a very very important question that you have raised. That uh, that despite so many years of uh, uh, independence in this country, caste is still thriving, and so is religious uh, discrimination on the grounds of religion. Uh, and and I think it's a very worrisome feature of Indian society. Uh, and what reports we hear are really unfortunate. When I hear of uh, uh, pregnant women who are Muslims being denied access to healthcare services because of their religion. It is even more disgusting when, uh, when there are some reports that I've seen of people putting up boards saying this is a Hindu shop uh, and so on and so forth or restricting access. I think the religious identity question is a very important one that is really threatens the secular fabric of this nation and it's something that uh, the COVID crisis has brought out. Uh, and it is something that was a concern even before the COVID crisis. And I'm glad it has now become a much more important a, a focus uh, because as we work together as a nation to combat the crisis, such divides people will realize and should recognize are absolutely disruptive to society. Uh, caste is again a very, very difficult subject. By the way, both the caste and religion issue are also related to the institution of marriage uh, and the institution of uh, enjoying and living together. Uh, and that is that's something that we really have to uh, address. So if you, if you add to the overall concerns that I talked about women, they are not, by the way, women and children, like I've been trying to say, are not a homogeneous group. Uh, there are, there, there are, uh, there are the more privileged and less privileged. And the privilege is determined by not just by income, but by considerations of caste, religion, and so on. Uh, extremely important to keep that in focus as we move ahead. Thank you, Professor. Uh, one more question from Jyoti Lange is, uh, um, and uh, from one more panelist, uh, is uh, you know, unless incomes increase in a meaningful way uh, for uh, uh, women uh, in rural areas especially, uh, how do we think about uh, uh, you know inequality? Uh, how about think? How do we think about benefits reaching them? Uh, yeah. The opinion is that unless incomes increase, we cannot think of a more equal society. Yeah, I think this is a very important question because if you look at it, is only 
when uh, women get income in their hands that it changes the power relationships with intra-household power dynamics and their own uh, respect in society and in the family goes up. So uh, having cash in hand or earning income, however small it is, is much more than the amount of money they bring in. The recognition of women in the household and in society really goes up. And studies have shown that when women uh, get this kind of income and have a paid employment and education, it also has a marked improvement in it manifests itself in improved child survival improved child nutrition and lower fertility so the benefits of employment paid employment and education are huge what is coming in the way of this and this has to do with like i like i hinted that we are a very conservative society a male dominated society the, the patriarchy as an institution is thriving uh, so much so that a higher percentage of women, according to the National Family Health Survey, 52% of women as against 42% of men uh, agree that a husband is justified in beating or hitting his wife. So, so, this, so we really have to work on, on tackling the social problem of society restraining and restricting the, what women would actually like to do. Uh, so the, the real secret there is therefore in uh, young women, uh, taking a stand, taking a stand and showing the way. In fact, when I see young the changes that I see in young women, both in rural and urban India, of how determined they are to achieve what they want to do, regardless of what parents say, I think that that agency of the child or the agency of the young person is extremely important. And second is we really have to do something about talking about equality, right? And gender equality and respect for women and freedoms for women from a very young age through school uh, and through our own behaviors and our actions. Stop. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. One last question. I think it's an important one because we did discuss this yesterday on the role of community institutions in, uh, in addressing inequalities, especially amongst women. Uh, what do you think is the role of SHGs uh, uh, in the context of NRLMs and SRLMs? How can they help address inequalities uh, before we move on to the next panel? Yeah, I know we're running out of time. I think I really feel that uh, self-help groups among women or cooperative societies or unions uh, are extremely important. Uh, we see the fantastic role that SAGs are playing in Kerala at this point of time. Uh, the, the amount of production of just not masks, also umbrellas, uh, which they have made, uh, which sort of uh, fulfills the, the, the social distancing of uh, physical distancing of six feet. Um, remarkable work so uh, self-help groups are doing. And once again, these self-help groups not only give women that ability to come out, organize themselves uh, and earn an income for themselves and support the families, uh, but, but it's also changes the position of women in society, the freedoms that younger girls can emulate and go ahead to schools, colleges, take on work, etc., and, and so on. So the, the role of these community institutions and self-help groups and women's cooperatives and unions is extremely important. I just hope we continue to encourage what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you for joining us. Everyone, that was Professor A.K. Shokmar, development economist, uh, so generous with his time. For, and uh, I think the comments here, if I go by them, I, you know, it's really appreciative of, uh, you know, you touching a lot of important topics. Uh, so thank you, sir, uh, for joining us. And uh, it was lo lovely having you here.